moves the switch <laughs> for the storm. Yeah, you are. Thank you. Blessed are you, Lord. Blessed are you. Blessed are you, Lord. High above all things you are. High above all things. High above all things. All things. Hallelujah. We bless your name. We bless your name. We bless your name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Scripture's reminder that God is the only God. Scripture's reminder that God is the only God. Scripture's reminder that God is one. Scripture's reminder that God is above all things. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, oh. and with all your mind. Right. And these words which I command you this day shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. And the second command is just like the first. The Ahafta, the Riachra, Kamoka. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Hallelujah. Let us lift up the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of Israel. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Be scattered. And may those that hate you 
flee from before you. For from Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord out of Yerushalayim. Blessed be he who in holiness gave the Torah to his people Israel. By even so Aharon, my own Moshe, Kuma Adonai, Thank you, Adonai, for being everywhere. Thank you, Adonai, for being found everywhere. Thank you, Adonai, for you, that you love to play hide and seek. Say it in scripture, if you seek me, you will find me. And I guess that means you're not really good at that game. You designed the game so you would lose it. We found you. Aha. It's like she shoes behind the curtain and you see his feet under the curtain. Peekaboo. Peekaboo. So thank you, Lord, for all you are, all you've done, all you are doing today, all you are going to do. Help us out and I to see the God who is. 
Because we can read all we want about the God who was. Oh, we fell in love with the God who was. We can read about the God who is to come. Oh, we love what you're going to do. We love that you're coming on the clouds, shining like the sun. We love the God who was. We love the God who is to come. God who is, we miss all the time. So help us to fall in love with the God who is today, right now. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's one epic flag. My gosh. <laughs> so today I got notes which is really like the opposite of a crutch. It's going to mess me up real bad. You know, there's, there's nothing, like, nothing like a little end times message to bring out the peeps. <laughs> nothing like a little end times to tickle those ears. A little mixture of end times and eclipses, and boy, you've got a service, boy, I'll tell you. you got some interest. Hallelujah. I should just end the service right now. Psych. Yeah. <coughs> Come on, everybody, wake up. All right. All right. I hate giving end times messages, by the way. We hate hearing them. Good. <laughs> Love that man. <laughs> I hate. I hate the good. Let's laugh. We're supposed to laugh during end times messages. <laughs> You know why I hate giving end times messages? Because God and I has not called me in this place to just disseminate information. If I'm speaking words and the flesh in you is not on the, on the path of dying through those words, I have not done my job. If Yeshua within you is not awakening more and more, then I have not done my job. Because I don't speak information. I speak as I hear the Spirit of God speak. So it's the Spirit of God in me speaking to the Spirit of God in you. And I have a little trouble doing that if I'm just giving information. So Father, I pray that, that over the next um, however long, Shabbat ends at sundown, so hang in there. That it's not just information. That spirit is intersecting with spirit. Amen. That flesh is dying. That spirit is awakening. So I felt compelled to give the message on the end times. Number one, every time we hit the book of Deuteronomy and we start to enter in the summer approaching the autumn, it's sort of where the spirit kind of goes. Especially when you understand that the Jewish roots and the Hebrew roots of the faith, we understand that the autumn festivals speak of the end times and we approach that. And there's just a shift, at least to me, uh, in the spirit where it just kind of goes there. All of a sudden, you know, you have things going on in the world, and all the end times prophets are out there screaming. And I have heard enough of end times prophets to be cautious in what I'm hearing. I've, I've had enough comets that never came, meteors that never hit, presidents that were supposed to do this but didn't, Popes that were supposed to do this, but didn't. I charge everyone here that we are bastions of truth, not lie. Hallelujah! And I tell you, in this place, there is a lot of lie. Just because it's on YouTube, <laughs> with a little bit of scary music, and an English accent doesn't mean it's true. Just because it seems to align with your world or spiritual view 
doesn't mean it's true. You may have a strong vision of the, the leaders of America putting us all into concentration camps. You may feel, oh, that makes sense to me. It doesn't mean that every person that puts a video about it is speaking truth. And I tell you, in this place, there are lies being disseminated. Lies. Unverified lies. And if you think social media is just a game, one post can go to millions. You can affect lots of people with one lie, more so than ever before. So God, your guard, your gates, guard your eyes, guard your ears, guard your mouth, and be careful, boys and girls, sons and daughters of God. Be careful that you're not inadvertently putting evil out there when we are bastions of light and truth. So here we are, and the end times prophets are once again raising their voices. So I figured I would give a little bit of a teaching on the end times. Gee, I said, like, let's celebrate the God who is, and now the message on what's going to happen. So I don't claim to be any expert on anything that hasn't happened yet. I believe that God loves to surprise us. I believe that as much as we have things figured out, we don't. And I believe it's designed to be that way, so nobody can boast, as it says. So we know the expression, two Jews, three opinions, Throw the book of Revelation in there, you got 10,000 opinions. So I don't know what's going on. So if you're expecting this to be like a, an exhaustive study on Revelation, that's not what this is. Or an exhaustive study of what's coming and when it's coming and all the precise this and that, I have no idea. I got some thoughts and I have some ways that I see the scripture. I'm just going to go through this a little bit, and I'm also then going to talk about the signs in the heavens, about things that are happening. Should we pay attention to them? Is it smoke and mirrors, or is it something that we need to pay attention to? Possibly. Okay, so that's kind of where I'm going to go, and I'm going to try to not make this go until sundown. Okay, so what is the end time? So when, when I, we talk about the end times, which in Hebrew is the acharit hayamim, which is the last days, or the... the, the the, the uh, end of days, the last, the last days, the Akhari Hayamim, uh, they are normally, it's normally three major events in the last days that uh, are, per, are relevant. Now, there's many details in those three events, but the three events are, number one, a time of tribulation, followed by the millennial reign of Messiah on earth, thousand years, followed by judgment for everybody and the closing up of everything okay within the tribulation it is normally thought that it is a seven-year period I don't know for sure if it is a seven-year period most theologians think it is a seven-year period that comes from the book of Daniel that talks about the final week talks about the 70 weeks and so there's one final week and they say okay that's the week of tribulation I personally do believe it is a seven-year period, but I have to say it is not explicitly said in Scripture that it is a seven-year period. Okay? The book of Revelation says nothing about a seven-year period. Or you could say seven trumpets or seven years or seven bowls or seven years and seven seals or seven years. You could theorize all that, fine, but there's nothing specific that says it is a seven-year period. But I believe it is a seven-year period. In, in the book of Daniel, in that, in that week, it's, it speaks about the beginning of that week. There's a covenant made. And at the, like the middle of it, I'll just read it. <laughs> That's why I have my notes. 
Um, he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but the middle of the week he'll put a stop to sacrifice and bring mm -hmm. offerings on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. So it seems like there's three and a half years of covenant, which to me might be some sort of world peace agreement. And then in the middle of it, the dragon is loosed on the earth and now it's just everything that goes to, you know, goes crazy. Um, it says, during that three and a half years, because in Revelation, I will grant authority to my two witnesses. They will prophesy for 1260 days, that's three and a half years, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. So to me, the two witnesses are, aren't just two dudes. To me, the two witnesses is Jew and Gentile together. It's this full body together. That's what it's, it means to me. Number one, it talks about olive trees. Okay, the two of them together. And we know that Romans 11 speaks about the olive tree and how there's the, the wild olive branches that are grafted in and the natural olive branches which are, are there, right? And natural olive branches got, 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 got pruned off, the wild olive branches come in. So this is Jew and Gentile together, right? So, so I believe when it says these are the olive trees, he's talking about Jew and Gentile together. And the lampstand, that's a symbolic thing of the temple, and you are the temple. So I believe that this, this is a large, it's not just two guys, I think it's Jew and Gentile together. So they, it seems that there's probably some sort of covenant that happens, and, and, the, and then all of a sudden the spirit of prophecy rises up in Jew and Gentile. And they're able to shut the heavens and open the heavens and stop the sun. All these things that we see in scripture, all of a sudden rises up, these gifts rise up. And, and they really tick off the world for three and a half years. Finally they are killed, and everybody's rejoicing over their dead bodies, and the, the Antichrist then takes over, and then it's like a big mess. Okay? Hey, it's a fun message. <laughs> okay, so that's kind of how I see tribulation. Um, then comes the thousand year reign. It says, then I saw thrones, they sat on them, judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of those who had been, been beheaded because of their testimony of Yeshua and because of the word of God, those who had not worshipped the beast or his image had not received the mark on the forehead and the hand. You see, what the beast does, it's a perversion of Torah. See, in Torah, it says you shall put the word of God on your hand yeah, yeah. and on the frontlets between your eyes. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden, like, the mark of the beast, whatever that is, is on the hand and the frontlets of your eyes. It's a perversion of Torah. Yeah. And they came to life and reigned with Messiah for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not yet come to life until the 1,000 years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who is part in that first resurrection. Uh, over these, the second death has no power, and they will be priests of God and of Messiah and will reign for him for a 1,000 years. So this concept of a 1,000-year reign of Messiah on earth, straight from Judaism, straight from Judaism, this is absolutely what Judaism believes. It will be 1,000 year messianic reign. They call it the messianic age. This is the time that all the prophecies about peace on earth will finally come to pass. The wolf and the lamb laying down with each other. All these spears and swords thrown away. Like all of these prophecies will come to pass within that 1,000 year period. This is Yeshua, the Messiah, reigning on earth with us for a thousand years. And the third is the final judgment. So it says, I saw the great white throne and him who sat upon it, uh, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away. No place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. The books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead, which were in it. Death and Hades gave up. This, this is just the resurrection of, like, everybody. Everybody that ever died, death just gives them all up. The sea gives up their dead. Hades gives up their dead. It's all everybody up. Mm -hmm. Get up, get up, get up. <laughs> and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name is not found written in the book of life, he's thrown into the lake of fire. So those are the three things. We have tribulation followed by the messianic age for a thousand years, followed by the final judgment. Does that make sense? That's pretty simple, right? So where am I going to
going to go with this. So when is this going to happen? Are we on the cusp of this? Are we not on the cusp of this? Like, when is this going to happen? So I believe that we are very, very close to the beginning of this. I believe that we are close to the time of tribulation. And I'll explain why. It says in... See, these notes are just messing me up. <laughs> I know what you mean. Anybody want some... Uh, Something for the old fires? Bird. <laughs> Bird cage liner? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Sounds good? Hallelujah. Oh. All right. I don't know where I'm going with this. Okay. All right, so when is this going to happen? So these are some hints that I, that where I think we're really close. Okay? It says in Exodus, it says that for six days you shall labor. And the seventh day is Shabbat. Right. Six days you labor, and the seventh day is Shabbat, Shabbat. <laughs> it says in 2 Peter, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. A thousand years are like a day. He's paraphrasing Psalm 90. So if a thousand years are like a day, and you labor for six days, and the seventh day is a day of rest, that means that humanity labors for 6,000 years. And the seventh is the millennial kingdom. So what we celebrate on a weekly basis is a taste of the real Shabbat. The millennial kingdom, the thousand year reign of Messiah. Okay? So where are we in that? Well, in Judaism, the year today is 5777. On Rosh Hashanah, in about a month, it'll be 5778. That is pretty close to the year 6000 when the 7000 millennium will start. So we are really close. Now it doesn't have to necessarily start right at the year 6,000. I mean, if we look at, at, at the way the sun goes down, wherever you are in the world, it may start early, whatever time of the year it is, it may start a little early, it may start a little late, but I can tell you right now, in spirit, the candles are being lit. Amen. In spirit, we are at the time of the sundown happening and the candles are being lit and the house is being prepared for the Shabbat. Amen. There was one vessel who, who wrote these, like, you know, every time I, I, I do this I, and I prepare for Shabbat and I clean my house and I do whatever I got to do before sundown, I feel like I'm intersecting with, with God's kingdom. Is that right, Rabbi? I said, absolutely that is right. Every time we do this, every time we prepare for Shabbat, we are preparing the way for the coming of the Lord. Amen. Because his coming... His reign on earth is the thousand year Shabbat. So I think we're really, really close. When in Matthew 24, his disciples asked him a couple of questions. Because they were checking out the temple. You know, Herod did a really good job making this nice, enormous temple. You can see the remnants of it if you go to Israel the wall that's still standing, and a lot of things that are not, not standing anymore. Just like Yeshua said. So, they said, check out this temple, Yeshua, Lord. He said, not one stone is going to be laid upon another. He said, it's coming down. He was right. Forty years later, it came down from the Romans. So they said, when is this going to happen? And... What is the sign of your coming? So those are two different questions. When is this going to happen? Already took place. When are you coming? Didn't take place yet. So you will see in his answer dual fulfillments. You will see things that pertain to what happened a generation later when Rome came in and conquered the city and destroyed the temple. And you will see his answers that speak to the end when he comes. Right? When he says, like, if, 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 if prophets, you know, 
Messiahs raise up and say, I'm the Messiah, don't listen to them. That happened back then. It all culminated with the Bar Kokhba revolt, where Judaism proclaimed this man, Bar Kokhba, was the Messiah. And he led a revolt against Rome, and millions of Jews were killed. So it was exactly as he said. But in his answer, he says this, learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has become tender and put forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until these things take place. This is a dual fulfillment. He was asked two questions. One, when is the temple going to be destroyed? Two, when are you coming back? That answers both questions. This generation will not pass away. It was 40 years later when the temple was destroyed. That generation witnessed it. The writers of the New Testament witnessed this. But which is the generation that will not pass away at the end? When Israel became a nation in 1948, that is the fig tree blossoming again. Yeshua cursed the fig tree that no fruit on you, I curse you. And that's how Israel has been for 2,000 years. But he says, but when you start to see the leaves come back, know that time is near. So when Israel became a nation again, that now we see the time is near, indeed, right at the door. And this generation, the generation that saw that event, will not pass away until all things are accomplished. That was 70 years ago. We are close. I hate notes. Put them on an iPad. Put them on my, yeah, that'll help. All right, I'm even going to skip a bunch of things. Okay, so the timing of the, the timing of the, of the, of the end times coincides with the Jewish Hebrew biblical festivals. This is extremely important to know and to understand because the Predominantly, the body of Messiah has no interest in the holidays that God instituted. <laughs> but Yeshua changed the paradigm of these holidays because the holidays were always a look back into what he already did. Passover, the Exodus, Shavuot, the giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai. It was always a celebration of what already happened. Yeshua comes in, twists it, and says, I fulfill everything. And they all speak to me. So he was crucified on Passover. As lambs are being slain all across Israel, he is on the cross at the exact same time. The Lamb of God. He is resurrected on the day that the high priest takes up the resurrected crops, the new crops that were dead and now coming in. He raises it before the Lord. That is biblical resurrection day. That is the exact day that Yeshua was resurrected. Fifty days after, the Holy Spirit is poured out from heaven on the exact day that the Word of God came forth from heaven on Mount Sinai. The exact day. All of the spring holidays were fulfilled in what we read in the New Testament. But there are autumn festivals that are not yet fulfilled. Yeshua fulfills everything, but there are certain things still to happen. And the autumn festivals, the fulfillment of them, are still to happen, they are yet to happen. So what are the autumn festivals? There is Rosh Hashanah, the day of trumpets, Yom Teruah. Number two, day of atonement, Yom Kippur. Number three, Sukkot, feast of tabernacles. Number four, the festival of the eighth day, Shemini Atzeret. And when I 
say festival or day or holiday or, or you know, I, I'm talking about the days where it says explicitly in Scripture, take a day off from work and celebrate. Okay? These are, in the Hebrew, it's moedim, appointed times. Appointments. God does not miss appointments. These are appointments. That's why Yeshua had to show up exactly on these days. Because he doesn't miss his appointments. Amen. So those are the four holidays, Moedim, appointed times in the autumn. The first one is trumpets. Now, a lot of people think that the trumpets is a rapture. But I tell you, with great respect to your Christian tradition, that's not what's going to happen. It's not the rapture. It's not a rapture. The day of trumpets is a day, even in scripture, of judgment. It is the day of the Lord. It's a day of judgment. And when you see seven trumpets happening in the book of Revelation, that is the fulfillment of the day of trumpets. It speaks of tribulation. It's not the rapture. It's tribulation. Number two, day of atonement. How is this fulfilled? The day of atonement in scripture is the only day, the only day where the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant is and makes atonement for Israel. That is the only day that that happens. The high priest does not enter in to the Holy of Holies any day but Yom Kippur. That is the only day where he even sees the Ark of the Covenant. That is the only day that the Ark of Covenant is revealed. If you go to the book of Revelations, you see seven trumpets, and at the last trumpet, it says, and the, this is Revelation 11, 19, it's the last trumpet, the seventh trumpet, and the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened, and the Ark of the Covenant appeared in the temple. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and great hailstorm. And that's what happens with the Ark of the Covenant. We see that even in the times of David. The, if in Revelation it says this is the revealing of the Ark of the Covenant, that is Yom Kippur. That is the only time that can happen. And that is with the seventh trumpet. It also says about the seventh trumpet, and it says, the seventh angel sounded, the seventh trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah. And he will reign forever and ever. So the seventh trumpet, the kingdoms of the world become the kingdoms of God. Wow. Okay? The seventh trumpet, the kingdoms of the world become the kingdoms of our God. And then it immediately goes into, and the Ark of the Covenant is revealed. That seventh trumpet happens on Yom Kippur. Wow. But wait a minute. Isn't Yom Kippur a day that has nothing to do with trumpets? The, the, the day of trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, is the trumpets. What does Yom Kippur have to do with trumpets? It does once every 50 years. On the year of Jubilee, it says in Torah, the trumpet is sounded at the end of Yom Kippur, and all land goes back to the rightful owner. So all the, over the course of 50 years, you can sell, I sell you land, you sell it to this person, whatever it is, at the end of 50 years, it all goes back to the original owner, because the Lord says it all belongs to me. That happens on the year of Jubilee, on Yom Kippur, on the exact same day that in Revelation it says the kingdoms of the world now belong to God. Oh, wow. <laughs> Do you understand? Yes. And a last trumpet is sounded. That is the last trumpet. If you look at the cycle of, of, of the holidays in Torah, the last 
trumpet sounded and all the all the all the cycles of God, the holidays, the seven year cycle, the 50 year cycle, the last trumpet in Torah is the one sounded at the year of Jubilee on Yom Kippur. That is the fulfillment of the last trumpet. So what else happens at the last trumpet? Notes. You're killing me, Mr. Note. Where are you? Take my time. It's so much easier to just paraphrase. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. I am blessed. First Corinthians 15, I tell you a mystery, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised in perishable. <laughs> resurrection into the kingdom Amen. the first resurrection that we spoke about it's the last trumpet it's when the dead rise Hallelujah. and come into the kingdom that is the resurrection the first resurrection of the dead this is why it's very challenging when I hear pastors saying that we're going to be taken out in a rapture from the tribulation when it said, when they use, this is going to happen, the changing in the twinkling of an eye, which is normally thought of as the rapture, happens at the last trumpet. The last trumpet. Well, what's the first trumpet? I have it listed here. First trumpet, hail and fire. That sounds like tribulation to me. Second trumpet, a great mountain burning with fire, thrown into the sea, a third of the sea became blood. That sounds like tribulation. Trumpet three, a great star fell from heaven, fell on a third of the rivers. Trumpet four, third of the sun, third of the moon, third of the stars were struck, third of the, uh, so a third of them would be darkened. Trumpet five, star from heaven fallen down to the earth. Key to the bottomless pit was given to him. Trumpet six, uh, release the four angels. Um, All right, I don't even have the notes. <laughs> oh, there it is. They would kill a third of mankind. Well, that sounds like tribulation. And the last trumpet is the kingdoms of the world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Messiah. So where is the rapture? If the rapture is at the last trumpet, right? It says the last trumpet. If that happens at the last trumpet, and we just saw that the last trumpet is all good, and the first six are tribulation, where is a rapture out of it? I tell you right now, with great respect for your Christian tradition, it's false. Amen. I'm sorry, but it is. There's no rapture out of this. So I'm sorry. <laughs> traditions and things like that, you know? So what is really happening and what happens when it says at the trumpet, where does it say it? Alright, so there's a couple things about the rapture I'm going to talk about that can prove to you that the rapture is, 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 is it's false theology. I'm sorry to tell you, it's a false theology. So if at the end of the, if at the last trumpet, the resurrection happens and we're meeting, it says that we meet Messiah, in the air, where is he coming from and where is he going? He's not just like coming to like give this appearance in the sky. That's not a second coming. That's like a second appearance. He's coming back to reign on earth. He's coming back. So if we are meeting him in some way, whether that's figurative or literal, he's coming back to Jerusalem. And if there is a meeting with him, if that's, if that's literal, all I got to tell you is that it's going to be the best long jump in the history of sports. <laughs> because he's bringing us back to Jerusalem too. In fact, this whole thing that like, like is he's taking us, the raptures of taking us up to heaven, it actually has its, its origin in something anti-Semitic. That's a replacement theology that says the church is now Israel. 
Heaven is now Jerusalem. So it's, it's part of that whole realm. In fact, in fact, so I'm gonna, I'll say a couple things about the rapture here. Wherever you are in my notes. Okay, all right. Here's another rapture verse, okay? This is gonna throw you, you ready? Ready to be thrown? Okay, Yeshua spoke in that same Matthew 24. The day or the hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will just be like what? The days of Noah. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Who were the they? Was it Noah? It's the people, right? It's the ones that got swept away, right? Right? So remember that, okay? They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark, and they, who's they? Did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. Right? Who, who was taken away? Yeah. The evil. The, the evil people who were, who were killed. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. There will be two men in the field. One will be taken. And one left. We just read it. In the days of Noah, who was taken? Yeah. The evil. Yeah. Who was left? Noah. This is normally considered the righteous are the ones taken. And the evil are the ones left. It is 100% the opposite. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to teach that here tomorrow morning, okay? <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm so thankful to be in the safe presence of Hallelujah! So what is this? What is this in gathering? When, when Yeshua said... Oh, this is going to flip you out. <laughs> this is that spiritual weed, bro. Where is it? Hold on. We're all spaced out now. Yeah, we don't need to smoke it either. <laughs> but where is the scripture of where, where Yeshua said he's going to gather from the four winds? It's in Matthew somewhere. Google it. I got it. <laughs> Thank you, Noah. There it is. And, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man. So the earth will, that's Yom Kippur, by the way, because it's, it's, that's Yom Kippur. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. That is the last trumpet. That's the one at the very end of Yom Kippur on the year of Jubilee. He will gather together his elect from the four winds. From one end of the sky to the other. Another verse that's normally translated as rapture. He's going to gather the elect from the four winds from the one end of the sky to the other, right? Yeah. Another rapture verse. Yeah. Listen to these verses in the Old Testament. He will gather, Isaiah 11, 12, he will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Deuteronomy 30, 3 and 4. Then the Lord will restore you from captivity, have compassion on you, will gather you again from all the people where the Lord has scattered you. If your outcasts are at the end of the earth, from there the Lord will gather you. From there he will bring you back. Isaiah 43, 5 and 6. I will bring your offspring from the east. I will gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. I will say to the south, don't hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. That's in the Old Testament. If Yeshua is saying, and he will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other, it's the same thing. This is not a rapture. It's the regathering of the Jews out of exile. And you're part of it. That is the meeting up with him. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So where are we going? Okay. So we spoke about. Um, we spoke about. Oh my gosh. I mean, you know, sometimes I think that there's so many uh, like leading 
you know, uh, people of God, pastors, reputable people, oh, yeah. you know, that are like, hallelujah, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. Don't you know that the book of Amos says, woe to you, that says, you know, the day of the Lord, that you're not supposed to want this thing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a day of tragedy, yeah. right? But they're like, hey, we're getting taken out. And it says in the book of Revelation that, that at one of the times in the woes of the seals or the schmeels, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that people start to because of all the, the horror that's happening people start to curse God yeah. well who are they? they're not the atheists oh. I, I wonder if these are, are, are the, it says even the elect will be deceived yeah. like how like there's been many over the course of Christianity these things called dis the great disappointments where like, people yeah. think they get raptured out and it never happens yeah. I'm sorry Sorry to burst some theological bubbles. And I reserve the right to be wrong about anything that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> so in, um, in, at the end of Revelation, it says the tabernacle of the Lord will now be with man. That is the fulfillment of the feast of tabernacles. Pretty simple. In fact, in fact, and this came to me just very recently, never came to me before, but it came to me as I was preparing for this. Of all the holidays in Torah, Passover, Shavuot, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Eighth Day, of all of those holidays, only three of them are pilgrimage festivals. Only three of them we are commanded to come to Jerusalem. Passover. Shavuot, Sukkot. Those are the only ones we're commanded to make Aliyah and go to Jerusalem. Yeshua fulfills all the Torah. He fulfilled the going up to Jerusalem on Passover. Mm -hmm. That's where he was. He fulfilled the Shavuot when his spirit was poured out from heaven. He will fulfill Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles, when he comes. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. He don't go. You're not going to find him. That's not when he comes. He comes on the pilgrimage festivals. So at the end of Yom Kippur, when it's over and the last shofar blows, he comes. The resurrection of the dead happens. And at that point, we go into preparation mode for the wedding. Because Sukkot is a wedding because it's a canopy. And Jewish weddings always have canopies. We get married under a canopy. In fact, when Yeshua said, you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, guess when that is said? At weddings. Anybody here that's been married or had their vows renewed here knows that the husband comes, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. I did it when I got my vows renewed, my 10-year wedding anniversary when Rabbi Peter renewed our vows. Wow, 10 years ago. <laughs> All right, where am I? So those are the holidays. Oh, and the eighth day, so after Sukkot, a lot of people don't realize that. After Sukkot, there's another holiday. And all it says is it's the festival of the eighth day, the assembly of the eighth day, Shemini Atzeret. Well, what happens after Sukkot? If Sukkot is, is, is him on earth, the millennial kingdom, the eighth day is heaven. Okay? All of these things are in the holidays. Every bit of the end times from the tribulation to his coming and his kingdom to the final judgment, it's all in the holidays. Okay? All right. So... All right, so I'm going to conclude with, so that's the end times portion of the, the, this. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so signs in the heavens. Okay. I'm about up to here, like I said, with comets that never came, with meteors that never struck. With all of that. There's a comet, there was a comet called Elenin a couple of years ago. Oh my gosh, it's come. And every time it, it crosses a certain thing, it, 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 an earthquake happens on Earth. And then NASA was going, these people are nuts. Yeah. But then the uh, time people said, well, don't believe NASA, that's the Illuminati. <laughs> They're in on it. Turns out they were right. This little guy just disintegrated. 
Okay? So I'm not up to here with it. However, it does say, because I don't want to be haughty, it does say in Genesis 1.14 that God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Signs yeah. and seasons. Okay? And so much of the end times is related to heavenly things, things happening up there. I mean, how many of the trumpets that we just read, that the stars are falling and the sun is falling? And by the way, these things can very easily be parabolic. Okay? One thing that came to me, it says that a third of the stars are going to fall. The sun, the moon, and a third of the stars are going to fall. Right? Well, who's the, who's the sun and the moon and the stars, according to Genesis? It's Israel, right? Joseph's vision, he says, you know, the sun's going to bow to me, the moon bow to me, and 12 stars are going to bow to me. Even Abraham was saying, your sons are going to be like the stars in the heaven. So now it says a third of the stars are going to fall. Do you know how much of Judaism was killed in the Holocaust? One third. Wow. Could that have been a fulfillment? It's possible. Okay? All right, so, anyway. Anyway, because, but because we do see Yeshua speak about, we see in Revelation, we see in Joel, the sun will turn dark, the moon will turn red. I feel that I still need to pay attention not be frightened by it, not to be alarming, because whatever God does, it's to kill what is not of him and to raise up him. And he, if he's going to start a shaking, the shaking is just to sift. Oh, is it leaking again? Thank you, Paul. So, remember a couple of years ago there were the blood moons, right? Do you remember the blood moons? Anybody remember or not remember the blood moons? There was, uh, the moon actually turned red on four Jewish holidays. It was uh, Passover, then Sukkot, then Passover and Sukkot. We had Sukkot on the property that year. We all just kind of gathered around and watched it happen, you know, at, at, while we were celebrating Sukkot. And when these things happen, I take note, okay? What I don't do is come to a conclusion of what the Lord is exactly doing. Okay, and I think we need to be mindful of that. It says in, in, one of my notes, Jeremiah 10.2, thus says the Lord, do not learn the way of the nations, do not be terrified by the signs of the heavens, although the nations are terrified by them. Isaiah 47.13, you are wearied by your many counsels. Let now the astrologers, those who prophesy by the stars, those who predict by the new moons, stand up and save you from what will come upon you. Okay? So God is telling us to not hyper-focus. So, there is eclipse, an eclipse happening um, on Monday. Um, it's a full eclipse that it's going to be seen all across America, not the full eclipse, but partially all across America, including Alaska and Hawaii. There is another eclipse, solar eclipse, that's going to happen seven years later, also traversing all of America in 2024. This one is just before the month of Elul, which is the 40-day countdown to Yom Kippur. That traditionally is the time that Jonah told Nineveh to repent. The one in seven years happens just before the first day of the first month of the year. So in Nisan 1. So I think these are significant. I, I do think there's a hyper-focus, by the way, on America. Okay? I think Americans think that America is, is, is ground zero for, you know, we tend to think that America is ground zero for all things in the Bible. I don't necessarily believe that. I get it. I mean, America is the superpower, and yeah, if America crashes, you know, you can see things happen. But I think there can be a hyper-focus on if it happens in America, that's a big deal. Okay? 
when I, all I see in scriptures is two nations. There's Israel and the Gentiles. So, you know? Um, so anyway, so that is happening. Does it mean anything? I don't know. I don't know. There's another sign that's happening. Everybody hear the Revelation 12 oh, yeah. sign? So this is kind of an interesting one. It says that a great sign appeared in heaven. This is Revelation 12. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, a moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. So a woman, okay? So now you have the constellation of, of Virgo, which is the woman constellation. By the way, I'm not crazy about this either because, like, look at the constellation. It's not necessarily scriptural, although you see the names of constellations in the scriptures. Yeah. Right? Job names a couple of them, Orion. Right? So it's there. So, but it's, it's just interesting. Things that make you go, hmm. Okay? So, okay. So it says in Revelation, a woman clothed with the sun. So you have the constellation of Virgo. Um, clothed with the sun. The sun on September 23rd, which is the Shabbat after Rosh Hashanah, which is called Shabbat Shuvah, the Sabbath of return. You see the sun passing through this constellation. Okay? If you, you just look at the maps and things like that. Now, I'm no expert on this, and it seems like this is accurate. I'm very cautious when things get published to make sure it's accurate. Okay? But this is, this is happening. So a woman clothed with the sun, and the sun is traversing through uh, the constellation Virgo. With the moon under her feet. On September 23rd, the moon is actually at the feet of Virgo. On her head, a crown of 12 stars. Above her head is the constellation Leo. There are nine stars in the constellation Leo, except on this particular time, Mercury, Mars, and Venus happen to be right there. So you do have 12 stars right at her head. You have the moon at her feet. You have the sun going right through her. And then the second part of that verse, it says, and she was with child. And Ju if you see in the next couple days, Jupiter goes right through her womb. So really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. So does it mean that we are on the verge of, of, of tribulation? Does it mean that America is on the verge of getting judged? So I will close with two things. As we enter into the month of Elul, this is the time for the people of God to, to repent yeah. and to seek his face and yeah. to say, Lord, if there's anything within me that is unholy, Father, yeah. please wipe it away. This is a yearly time for us to just get right with the Lord. Say, Lord, search me, search me, search me, search me. Search me, search me, search me. It is the time to get right with the Lord. With the Lord, it is the time to repent for ourselves. It is the time to repent for our nation. I'm, I'm praying about having a prayer walk, like a Mishkan prayer walk, where we just kind of just walk and pray and repent and However that's the Lord would lead with that, I'm, I'm praying about that. But this is actually the time on the biblical calendar to, to, to seek the Lord, seek his face, repent for our sins, for the sins of our fathers, for the sins of our nation. This is the time to do it. And I will say this also. Judgment starts with the house of God. That's right. And it's exactly what was written in Paul's life. Don't worry about the people outside. I'm telling you that God is less concerned about a homosexual pagan nation that he is about a homosexual church. I'm talking in spirit. A, a sinful church. A sinful congregation. His people. Judgment starts with, that, with the house of God. And I tell you that you, as people of God, have his ear. There's one time in, in, in the book of Amos where Amos has this vision of like, there's this, these, these, these soldiers and of a war coming towards Israel, and oh my God, he gets on his face and he says, Lord, please stop, Israel cannot withstand this. And it says, the Lord changed his mind. And then he saw another vision of a famine coming to Israel, and he says, Lord, please stop this. Israel cannot withstand this. And it says, the Lord changed his mind. Yeah. We see multiple instances of yeah. scripture where the Lord set out an assignment against Israel. And his people stood in intercession. Yeah, and the yeah. Lord canceled yeah. the assignment. I'm not yeah. saying any of this is going to happen. But that power is within you. Because yeah. you have his ear. So, rejoice. Redemption is very, very close, I believe. 
But if, if it is precisely year 6,000 and the Jewish people are right, we got a couple more hundred years to go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> all right. That's all I got. Amen. Amen.